Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Data Byte number 155. My name is Meg Young. I'm a participatory methods researcher in the Algorithmic Impact Methods Lab at AI on the Ground. I'm going to be co-moderating today's discussion on democratizing AI, principles for meaningful public participation, alongside my colleague, the Data and Society Policy Director, Brian Chen. For those of us join for those joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology and society. Now, I'm very excited to introduce you to our distinguished panel. Michelle Gilman is the Venable Professor of Law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She directs the Saul Ewing Civil Advocacy Clinic in which student attorneys represent individuals and community groups in a wide array of civil litigation and law reform projects. Harini Suresh is a postdoc at Cornell University and an incoming assistant professor of computer science at Brown University. Her work asks how diverse participation and knowledge of societal context can meaningfully shape the machine learning life cycle from problem conceptualization through to evaluation. Richard Wingfield is the Director of Technology and Human Rights at BSR. He works with tech companies, particularly those based in or with operations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, to build human rights considerations and practices into their products, services, and policies. And I know you all are as excited as I am about these amazing panelists. I would encourage you to put your questions into the chat for the last quarter hour. We'll be taking Q&A. And now over to you, Brian. Thanks, Meg. I am really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, so before we jump into it, <clears throat> I'd like to just kind of first ground us with the tension that this uh, data bite is meant to investigate. So on the one hand, we have technology that is being used by governments and by private companies in ways that are dramatically impacting people's lives, their outcomes, the kind of opportunities that they have in their, in their daily uh, lives. And with AI, the problem really has only gotten worse and, and more intense given the kind of scale and breadth that AI technologies present. It can extract people's data. It can incentivize physical surveillance. The use of AI and other kinds of algorithms can be used to foreclose opportunities in housing and employment and healthcare and so on. And so the stakes are, are really dire. And at the same time, people have few real means to change that status quo, to really challenge the design and deployment of these systems to really be integrated into the decision-making around these technologies. One solution that often comes up when uh, policymakers and others are confronted with this problem is this idea of public participation and public participation in AI. And there is a lot packed into that phrase, public participation. So I am really pleased to introduce uh, our panel here today and What's notable is that they are so interdisciplinary, the three of them. We have a legal scholar whose work focuses on, on poverty and how government deployment of tech can have the effect of increasing inequality and worsening social conditions for people. We have a computer science professor with deep experience uh, building machine learning products and working in partnership with impacted communities. And we have someone who is a human rights lawyer who works very closely with tech companies on how they can ethically and responsibly deploy their new technologies. So I would love to start with um, Michelle. We're here to, um, in large part, we're here because you've, you've written this new policy brief called Democratizing AI. I'd love to start with you and, and then subsequently to kick it to our other panelists. But Michelle, how do you think of this, this phrase, public participation? Um, what yeah how let's let's kick it off with you michelle sure well that's a really important question because without some shared conception of what it means we could end up with models that are very tokenistic or ritualistic or even quite exploitative of the public 
Um, there was a public policy analyst in 1969 named Sherry Arnstein, who set forth a very influential ladder of public participation. And it ranged from you know, talking to the public at the bottom to full citizen control at the top. And her really valuable insight is that some commitment to power sharing between decision makers and the public is essential to advance democratic principles. So in the policy brief, I designed public participation with that in mind. I say public participation consists of measures that offer opportunities for people most likely to be affected by a given system to have influence into the system's design and deployment, including decision-making power. That's great, Michelle. And, and you, men you mentioned uh, Arnstein's theory of this ladder, these different steps of participation. I I'd love, uh, maybe if we could turn to you, Harini, um, even if you do not quite have a concept of a ladder, how are, how are you thinking about public participation? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I think my conceptualization of public participation really echoes what Michelle says. And I, I think about it as a tangible method to shift power, which is currently super concentrated when it comes to building technology and AI systems. And I think we can think about the latter as like how much power is actually being shared or shifted or changed. Um, so when we think about how um, AI systems sort of scrape data that people are fr from people's web activity, like that's not really doing much to, to shift power. In fact, a lot of that um, data collection is unacknowledged, um, not paid, it, like takes more, more so takes the form of surveillance. Um, so yeah, I think participation ideally can allow a much more diverse set of voices and perspectives to shape what technological systems are even being built and for what purposes. Um, and it's also a way to acknowledge and respect the deep expertise that different um, and, and kinds of different kinds of knowledge that people coming from different contexts and backgrounds can bring to the table. Thank you. And, and, and Richard, how is public participation in your work consulting with uh, these tech companies? How is it showing up? Well, I think we wouldn't necessarily use the term public participation, but there's a there's a huge amount of overlap between um, what we would term stakeholder engagement as is a requirement under the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. So for companies that are thinking about their human rights impacts or potential potential impacts, the guiding principle set out a framework for how they should identify potential risks and take steps to mitigate and remediate risks that have materialized. And, and core to that is this principle of stakeholder engagement. So talking to potential rights holders or other stakeholders who might be affected or impacted by those companies' risks. And so I'm I'm interested to, to through this discussion to see how, how far that concept overlaps with, um, in my mind, what I it might be a slightly an even broader concept of public participation that goes beyond just stakeholder engagement at certain phases of, of the tech life cycle. But to kind of echo the, the sort of the points that the other speakers have made, I think why it's such a critical part of the guiding principles is because you can't rely on a particular company to fully understand the potential risks and impacts of its products and services. And I would say that's particularly true when it comes to technology, including AI, partly because we know that the developers of many of these technologies are from a, a very a fairly narrow subset of the of the global population, um, but also the design and the development of these products will have massively different impacts in different parts of the world with different stakeholders, different groups, different governments um, as well. And so, understanding those perspectives is, is absolutely critical, um, more so for impact when it comes to technology than than, than even other sectors. That's great, thank you, Richard. And just a few of the things that I just heard. I heard the, the UN guiding principles, Sherry Arnstein's theory of this, this ladder of participation. And so, Michelle, I, I mean, bringing it back to you, one of the main insights, really, uh, of your brief is that this is well-traveled territory in some ways. This is not, this is not new. Uh, people need not reinvent the wheel here. Um, and in your brief, you draw on a lot of other fields, non-tech fields, and their experiences with this concept of public participation. What fields are you drawing from and what lessons do they offer? Thank you for that question. So yes, this may be a new conversation in the tech space, but it's not a new concept in other regulatory areas. I've been representing low income people for over two decades and I have 
touched different regulatory regimes uh, where public participation has long been required, such as land use decision making, anti-poverty programs, and particularly environmental law. And these are all regulatory areas where the risk of harms are most serious for marginalized people. So yes, my project was about finding what can we learn in terms of what to do and what not to do. As you said, we do not need to recreate the wheel. And I would say the core takeaway here is that Yes, public participation can make a difference. It can. It can improve the output of decision-making processes. Um, it brings social and cultural values into decisions that can be highly technical, um, highly scientific. It can add legitimacy to decision-making when people realize they've had a voice in shaping the systems that impact their lives. And it can promote accountability. All that being said, it doesn't happen automatically and it can backfire if it is not done well. The worst case scenario is bringing community members in as some form of window dressing to give a stamp of approval to a project that they have you know, no say in. So when public participation works, it's because it has been very intentionally designed with these power dynamics in mind. Um, it has to center the needs and interests of the people who are impacted and decision makers really have to commit to not just listening to what the public says, but to adapting their projects based on the public's input. So these are important lessons that have been learned over decades and decades in other fields. And this tech space is an area where we can draw upon those lessons as we move forward. And speaking of moving forward, Harini, your work is so unique because you build new systems uh, with participation baked in. It emphasizes early involvement from the community members that you work with, including at the stage of problem conceptualization, which is so important. Will you tell us a bit more about your work building machine learning uh, models and how you built participation directly into that work? Yeah, so um, I think it might make sense to just focus on one specific project and kind of walk through how we made these decisions. Um, and it requires a little bit of context, so bear with me. So this project is part of um, a broader initiative called Data Against Feminicide, and it involves many collaborators, especially a lot of people from the Data Plus Feminism Lab at MIT. Um, and so the motivation for this initiative is to support and build community among activists who collect data on gender-related violence and its lethal outcome, feminicide or femicide. Um, so feminicide is systematic and prevalent, but official data about it is often unreliable, um, contested, inaccurate, Unfrequently, infrequently updated, et cetera. Um, so in response to this missing data, civil society activists collect and maintain sometimes the most accurate records of feminicide in their context, um, which is empowering and also lends visibility and legitimacy to the problem. Um, so at the beginning of this initiative, we didn't have a specific idea of, okay, we're going to like build this to help these activists. Um, rather, we were just interviewing and talking to a lot of people that do this work in different global contexts. Um, and as these interviews went on, it emerged that many groups across different locations use news media as a main source to find cases of feminicide. Um, and to do this, they often use broad search queries that return a lot of articles, um, and they read through all of them, many of which are not actually relevant cases, but describe other kinds of violent um, events to find the few that are actually relevant that they then record. I mean, as you can imagine, this is time consuming, emotionally intensive labor. Um, so we tried not to assume that we knew what the best solution to this problem would be. Um, and we worked closely with two activist groups to do a bunch of open-ended brainstorming and co-design around if and how technology could support this work. Um, and it was through these co-design sessions that we ended up with two ideas slash designs that we ended up building. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of them, which uses machine learning. Um, and it basically involves scraping news articles from many different sources each night, running these articles through machine learning models, which predict if they're relevant to a particular group's monitoring effort. Um, and if they are, the system ranks them by predicted relevant and predicted relevance and sends them to activists um, in an email alert and dashboard. 
Um, so it was super valuable to your question, Meg, of having activist partners shaping the process, especially at the stage of problem conceptualization. Um, it heavily influenced what we ended up building together and how. Uh, they came with a lot of knowledge around which parts of this work made sense to support with technology, what parts did not, how we could build something that was um, sort of augmenting and supporting the work that people were already doing rather than trying to replace it. Um, and it was also a really important part of building trust and long-term relationships. Um, so the development, of, the development of the actual tool then involves several bu building several machine learning models to predict different kinds of feminicide, um, and data sets for this task didn't exist. So we went through these stages of participatory data collection, annotation, modeling, um, and evaluation. Uh, and obviously, I don't have time to like describe every one of those steps, but reflecting on the process, um, there's maybe like three sort of takeaways I could highlight. So the first is just that um, participation was really important for shaping each step. So for example, during data collection, activists sort of drew from their lived experience doing this work to anticipate kinds of examples that were likely to be underrepresented. So for example, they told us that trans feminicides or feminicides of transgender women are often difficult to find or written about differently. So that prompted us to do a few rounds of targeted data collection to make sure that trans feminicides were represented in our data set. Um, their expertise also shaped categorization schemes, understanding where the boundaries were between different annotations should be, um, and essentially allowed us to embed this localized expertise in the data. Um, the next takeaway I wanted to highlight is that participation isn't one size fits all. Um, and we found it really important to embrace plurality. So for example, our first round of models worked really well for some groups, but not for others, especially those who were monitoring intersectional violence, such as missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and it, having participation from several groups, in particular, those facing multiple systems of marginalization was really important, especially as we were evaluating how the system was doing. Um, and I think in general, beyond this project, it's important to remember that participation from one community doesn't necessarily serve as a universal proxy for others. Um, and participation from different communities might tell you different things. And that's, in fact, that's probably expected. Um, and building in that conceptual pluralism to whatever we end up doing is important. Um, and then my final point um, that I thought is interesting is just that it was important for us to find the balance between meaningful participation and unintentionally overburdening um, people that we were working with. So for example, rather than ask um, activists to look at and evaluate every version of a model we came up with, we had sort of a, a multi-stage process where we would do several rounds of evaluation internally to build up some confidence that, okay, based on what we know about your work, like this is this might be useful. Um, and then we would ask them to do a more involved extended evaluation. So it, it's not necessarily the case, I think, that more participation at every decision point is necessarily um, needed and can sometimes lead to, to burnout. Uh, but instead, there are important decision points and identifying those should be a collaborative process. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll end there for now and I'm happy to talk more about any of these points. Yeah, thank you. That that that's so fascinating to hear uh, from kind of from the ground up how you're how you're building these these models. I wonder, Richard, because your work, I, mean, I imagine, is is quite different. You're not quite building these things from the ground up, but you're working with tech companies, um, oftentimes these big, big, powerful tech companies, um, and your 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 focus is on human rights and the way that these companies can incorporate human rights due diligence. Part of which is this stakeholder engagement. I'm wondering, in your experience, what of the Harini just mentions uh, uh, burnout, but uh, I, I, what are the, some of the constraints that you see pop up time and time again um, from these these teams within tech companies that prevent them from doing stakeholder engagement in a more robust or, or more high quality way? Sure, and I think it's it's reasonable to say that although the concept of stakeholder engagement within the human rights framework, within the UN guiding principles, has existed since their endorsement um, by the UN Human Rights Council coming up for twelve years ago now, um, and 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 before that, in fact, I don't think there's any sector or particularly company that's really nailed it. Um, and so there's no, I'm not even sure there's a gold standard out there in terms of what really. Um, impactful and effective stakeholder engagement looks like as companies are, are doing that human rights due diligence. There are a number of constraints which are perhaps 
more relevant to the technology sector than others. Um, one is the sheer potential range of rights holders or stakeholders that might be affected by a new technology. You know, we're not looking at um, a particular product, a tangible product, a kinetic product that might go to a very small market. People were not looking at a potential operations in a physical location that might only affect that geographical area. We're looking at the development of technologies that might be used and, and impact upon hundreds of millions or billions of people around the world, ultimately, for some of these really large companies. So how do you undertake meaningful stakeholder engagement when, when the number of stakeholders who could be affected, you know, could be in, in the number of the billions? So I think the real challenge there is how do you find, you know, a representative sample or, or how do you make sure that you take into account the full range of perspectives and nuances that, that are going to be relevant? And that's a real challenge, given the diversity of, 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 the, of the world that we live in. Connected to that is there may not always be stakeholders in many parts of the world or in certain communities who um, are able to provide uh, the kind of input that a company is going to be able to, to, to use. There may be language barriers, there may be restrictions on free expression and civil society and academic freedom in parts of the world, particularly those where human rights violations are going to be the greatest. There may be uh, digital divides, which mean that, that new technologies are not used by large numbers of people yet, and there's not the familiarity, therefore, with the risks that they pose. So identifying stakeholders can be challenging. Um, and that means looking at potential proxies as, as well, which, which are, you know, which are an alternative, but not, but not, but not a perfect substitute. Um, another challenge that I think is particularly relevant for the technology sector is the rollout and the speed by which there's expectations in internally for this work to be undertaken. I mean, to take an example, earlier this year, um, we started to see the first, you know, publicly available generative AI tools with, with ChatGPT and, 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 and DALI. Every other company that was thinking about AI wanted to make sure they weren't too far behind or you're going to lose that competitive edge. To, to the market leaders and to those who get the products out first. So how do you meaningfully engage, engage stakeholders, which is not a quick process, when you've got days or weeks to get your product out and the pressure internally is for you to do that as quickly as possible? And I think a final complicating factor um, is that it is, although there are definitely opportunities for stakeholder engagement, you know, when we have new launches of products or, or new technologies are starting to go out onto the market, in many cases, the human rights risks are cumulative and, and, and grow over time. If you look, for example, at Facebook as an example of a social media platform, yes, there would have been human rights risks when it was launched. Um, but I don't think anyone would have expected at that point that it would have connections to, you know, mass violence or, or you know, even links to, to sort of allegations of genocide in parts of the world. And it wasn't one particular decision that Facebook made. Um, it was a combination of decisions around where it, which markets it would go into, what products and features would be available, decisions around the number of content moderators and languages that it would invest in. So there was no kind of single point at which perhaps that risk would have really clearly materialized. It was perhaps something that would have only come about through, through really ongoing long-term stakeholder engagement. So the demand to do that on a regular ongoing basis, as opposed to particular decision points products and modification market entry, I think further complicates and, and perhaps leads into the, the, the topic of stakeholder fatigue, which we might get into later in this discussion. Yeah, Richard, thank you. The, the, certainly the, the difficulties and complications are, are, are many. And Harini, I noticed you nodding quite a bit during Richard's answer. I'm wondering if perhaps you've seen um, constraints in your own work doing this work um, and maybe particularly in uh, in some of the, the academic work that you've done, um, constraints that you've encountered? Yeah, um, I mean, I think a lot of what Richard spoke to on just sort of the, the difficulty of understanding the right way to do things and the right people to work with are, are sort of universal issues in academia as well. It's just, uh, it's, yeah, it's 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 just really complicated in a lot of cases. Um, but I think maybe a, a parallel to what um, Richard was getting out with sort of timelines and competitive um, advantages applies in academia as well, um, whether it takes the form of sort of publishing pressures or um, doing your research kind of being pushed in a direction that will produce something that appears more novel rather than something that's more sort of reflective of community needs or something. So I think there are there are incentives like that that can kind of um, push you towards doing research that will that's that's quicker than sort of establishing 
these kind of like long-term relationships. That's, um, I don't know, more kind of, uh, that fits into sort of cultural expectations in different fields, um, things like that. And, and I think this, this is an issue with funding as well. Um, so for the Data Against Feminicide Project that I described, one thing um, that's a bit challenging now is that we, we built the system and, and we were able to sort of present it in an academic conference, which was great, and sort of talk about it in terms of to a research community. But the the work that comes after that of like, Oh, the server crashed. We have to we have to fix it. Like a new a group's needs are changing, and we have to update models. Like that's sort of the maintenance and sustainability work. That's not necessarily like a new model or a new method. And so it's not as easy to sort of get funding for that to sort of talk about it in terms of oh, this is academic research that we're doing. Um, so that yeah, I don't know. I think that's kind of an, an outstanding challenge that I haven't quite figured out the right way to, to deal with that, but it, it would be great if there were sort of funding allocated specifically for like, okay, you built something, you did that like novel work. Now you need to make sure that it, you don't just like leave it to sort of break down. Thanks, Serini. Um, Michelle, you know, we've, we've surfaced now the constraints for industry doing this or research doing this, but um, still, we must encounter these constraints and move forward. And your brief delivers such a strong message about uh, how hard law requirements can help us push through those hurdles. I was wondering what you mean by hard law. We've got such a, a diverse audience here. And uh, why is it important? What kinds of things do policymakers need to be writing into these laws to make them effective? I think it's really important that public participation not be left to the benevolence of corporate or government entities. It shouldn't be a matter of the whims of powerful entities, whether they want to grant this to the public or not. I think it should be encoded into law. This is how it works in the areas I mentioned earlier, such as environmental law. All of us have rights as a matter of statute to comment on environmental actions that could have a significant you know, impact. And if the government doesn't follow those legal requirements, we can sue them, <laughs> right? So you have um, a law setting forth requirements that is also enforceable. And I think that's exactly what we are going to need in the tech space, especially given the power differentials that are at stake. Um, so yes, I would like to see public participation codified, you know, written into law, passed by Congress in all the tech legislation that's being proposed and is on the horizon. Um, I think a hard law requirement, it also helps like sort of normalize public participation and operationalize it. It will become part of the institutional culture of agent, government agencies and private companies. And if the public knows that it's supposed to be happening, then it's something that they can engage with and monitor and make sure that it is you know, happening in its robust form. So in the report, I do list the elements of what I think would make for an ideal statute. I'll just mention three of them for now. Um, I think it's important that a statute define what are the goals of the public participation process. I think a statute should require two-way deliberation between the public and decision makers so that the public isn't just talked at or ignored. Um, and I think it's really important to build in affirmative action to impacted communities, right? So not just putting on the internet, you know, we welcome your feedback, but actually going out into communities through a wide variety of ways to invite people and give them the resources uh, to participate effectively is really, really important. Well, as a as a former lawyer, my my ears perked up when you said, "Let's sue people." We can we could if these were if these, this was in a statute, we could sue people. Um, Harini, I want to ask you. So, in a lot of your your, your work, um, you've written about public participation, um, and in your writing, you've talked you've made this distinction between participation as consultation and participation as justice. And I'm wondering if you could uh, just briefly expand on that idea for our audience. You're muted. Sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, 
that distinction between um, consultation and justice is drawn from um, a framework by Mona Sloan and others where they, yeah, distinguish between work, this idea where consult participation as consultation is um, okay, as builders, designers, et cetera, we need to bring people in so that we can figure out what they need and then build that for them. Um, as and, and distinguishing that from participation as justice, which hinges on values of reciprocity and sustainability and co-ownership, and there there being a lot more on the table that people can shape. Um, and another lens that I might add to this sort of distinction is how these different paradigms implicitly view expertise. So I think in the first setup, it can often fall into this framing of, okay, people with formal training in machine learning or engineering or whatever are experts and everyone else is kind of non-experts or lay people. And that framing, I think, then implies that, okay, it's the responsibility of the experts to figure out what um, the lay people need and then create that for them. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's there's a different view of expertise we might take that says actually it's people embedded in different contexts have extremely valuable expertise about the intricacies of their environments and communities and what the problems um, actually are. And with this local ex and having this local expertise are much better suited to notice and anticipate when and how systems might succeed or fail. Um, and so our approach to participation then becomes more about expanding expertise and bringing in knowledge that's necessary but missing. Um, and that framing kind of prompts a sort of participation that's built on respect and trust and co-ownership and long-term sustainability. Um, and the last thing I'll add to this is that there, th this doesn't negate the issue that all of these people do need to be speaking in a shared language or able to sort of communicate with each other. And um, to the point of where can we draw on different fields, I think there's a lot we can draw from education and pedagogy and cognitive psychology and data visualization to understand like, how can we communicate about these topics and allow people to sort of contribute their expertise, but in a way that's intuitive and sort of, um, yeah, in a way that's intuitive and easy for them and really like gives them that agency. I wanted to jump on this uh, to ask you, Richard, a follow-up question. Harini's talking about um, the different kinds of expertise that are at the table, but we've also, um, I recall that in your work that this digital literacy piece is um, also a piece that BSR faces in trying to find the right partners for its work. So will you talk a little bit about your perspective on um, what Irini calls uh, increasing the expert, uh, increasing the education and capacity for our partners to be able to engage on these um, discussions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the points that I referenced earlier is the lack or the perception that there's a lack of good stakeholders represented in certain interest groups from, from different parts of the world or from different communities who can provide the kind of input that companies can 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 utilize to be able to 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 modify their products or services or to make dif make different decisions. Um and that's challenge is kind of exacerbated by the fact that for many of the new products or services or technologies that companies are developing, it can feel quite abstract or hypothetical to then talk to a stakeholder about what the potential risks might be, because at that point, the tech might not be out there. And so and, and so they may not be able to conceptualize what in practice um, would be the harms that that, that would, would follow. And so I think many companies uh, rely on stakeholders who follow technological developments very closely and so are most likely to be aware of what kind of technology is already out there, what the risks are, what's kind of coming up in the pipeline, how that technology has led to certain harm um, previously in, in their own country or, or elsewhere. And if you take that narrow subset of organizations, you know, many of which would be lumped together as digital rights organizations, those that really focus on technology, there aren't that many. Most countries in the world don't have a digital rights organization. The vast majority maybe have one or two. Um, and so I think what that requires is uh, a, a responsibility in many respects for companies to make greater efforts to increase the number of stakeholders that, that can meaningfully participate by building their capacity. And that means building their technical expertise around how technology works, 
um, being very frank with them at a, a sort of an early stage about what is in the development uh, within particular companies uh, and perhaps some of the risks that they themselves have, have, have identified. Um, so I think there, there is a kind of onus, I think, on companies not to just sort of use what's already out there, but to, to use their resources to sort of grow grow the number of stakeholders that they can, they can meaningfully engage in. Um, perhaps we'll come on to this later, but, but you know, that then is also quite a big demand of, of quite often time and resource strapped CSOs who, who don't, who for the most part um, get funding by governments or other uh, funding organizations for specific pieces of work. They don't just have infinite amounts of time to sort of do work for free. And so I think that kind of connects to the question of, well, well what is the, what is the the compensation essentially for stakeholders who participate? Yes, there's the hope that that by engaging they will benefit because therefore the tech is less likely to to cause them harm. But but in the more immediate sense, how are they going to be compensated for the time that's going to be invested by by their team, by their staff that then isn't spent on projects that are funded, which is which is primarily how NGOs work. So I'm talking very specifically perhaps about NGO work there, but that is a significant part of the stakeholder community. Thank you. That is tied to something I really wanted to hear from you about. And uh, to the audience, please prepare your questions. We'll be transitioning soon to audience Q&A. But mm -hmm. Richard, uh, you know, you talk about the, the extra pressures and sometimes unfunded work that is asked of our partners in civil society. And you've talked before about burnout. I was wondering if you could give us some more details about what exactly is asked from orgs in these contexts and how often and what options you've seen for overcoming burnout? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the there is an inherent challenge in as much that there is a relatively small pool of organizations out there who are regularly contacted by, by some of the largest tech companies in their stakeholder engagement. For the most part, you know, they, they have to be organizations that can understand and focus on technology and technology policy ideally speak English because many of the stakeholder engagement teams for these companies are, are English speakers. Um, there's time zone issues as well. So they have to be in a time zone where communications are going to be feasible. Um, and so there's kind of all of these, these sort of elements that kind of narrow the pool of organizations. So that even without additional complications that I'll go into in a moment, there's just a finite and a small number of organizations that are doing the vast majority of that stakeholder engagement that exists at the moment. But um, one of the sort of interesting points that Michelle made is around the um, the growing calls for, for statutory stakeholder engagement. And we're starting to see this now in the European Union. So, for example, the Digital Services Act, which requires social media platforms to undertake risk assessments on their platforms for different risks of harm. Um, there is an, an implicit requirement, it's not mandatory as such, but it is strongly encouraged in the language of the legislation that to identify risks they should engage stakeholders. So what does that mean in practice? That means that at a certain point of the year, because this is all scheduled you know, along a certain calendar year, every single tech company within the scope of that regulation will say, right, we need to talk to stakeholders to meet this regulatory requirements. So NGO X in Europe will get 20 emails saying, can you find time for a one hour call in the next couple of weeks to talk about some of the risks on our platform? So that's that's the kind of thing that I mean. It's, it's really it's intense pressures on 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 time, and you know there's an argument as to whether an hour conversation is really meaningful engagement at all. But let's say that that, that that's what the, what what's asked for. It may, and 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 the way to address that is in many respects for companies to work together to speak to stakeholders so that it is the the commonalities of the technology or their functions that they're receiving input on rather than just one company at a time. But that means that you will then talk to stakeholders quite often at conferences or events, because that's when lots of stakeholders come together around a, a common issue. What does that mean? That means side events. It means evening meetings. It means it means further eating into the time of these organizations. So I don't think there's a silver bullet to how you address stakeholder fatigue. I think in some ways, more statutory expectations it increase the challenge as well as, as well as sort of responding to different challenges that Michelle outlined, but I think greater collaboration by companies um, when speaking to state, stakeholders is absolutely critical. How they do that in a way that doesn't undermine their own, you know, um, commercial trade IP interests uh, is an additional challenge to that. 
Um, but I think I think that's the kind of direction that we need to go, increasing the pool of stakeholders that companies speak to through education and, and building capacity, but also trying to instate, engage with stakeholders collaboratively across a sector, within a company, within a market, to reduce the demands um, on, on those stakeholders who are um, you know, participating. Thanks, Richard. Um, before we turn to audience Q&A, um, Michelle, I'm gonna turn to you for, for our, our last question and then maybe Harini and Richard, if you have additional thoughts, uh, we could open up to you. But <clears throat> Michelle, your, your policy brief, you know, drawing on these principles of public participation is I would say on the whole kind of optimistic about um, the, 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 the benefits of public partic participation, but while being pretty, you know, realistic about how difficult and complicated it can be. There's no one size fits all model. I'm going to put on my cynical hat and I'm going to just kind of ask you to respond. So there, I, I see it as there are, that you could have these procedural steps of public participation in AI governance. You know, you could, you could have companies do the outreach to certain groups, make sure those groups are diverse and representative. They can make sure they're consulted at X, Y, and Z times. And then there's the actual question of whether marginalized groups truly are able to address the role of technology in their lives. And I think one insight that your brief offers is that if a company does all those steps poorly, that the end result is going to be real, real, uh, very poor. None of the dynamics will really change. I think a more provocative observation might be that someone could do all those procedural steps really well, very carefully, very thoughtfully, and still people might not have the power to materially improve the conditions um, in their lives, including the tech around them. I wonder, is that an observation that uh, you think is fair and, and how should we be thinking about really shifting power and not doing this kind of participation washing or tokenizing of participation? Well, I think one really important insight came from Harini earlier and that's that the public should be involved at the outset including devising the public participation mechanisms that are gonna work for them and meet their needs. So this idea of participation has to happen with regard to how participation is gonna happen, right? So really, really at the early stages is important. And none of this is gonna work if decision makers are wedded to a preformed plan and aren't able to move off of that. There has to be a willingness to um, adapt to what they learn from the public. At the same time, even if we have those uh, mechanisms in place, we have to realize that the type of public participation we're talking about today, ideally statutorily mandated, as I said earlier, it's not the only way that the public shapes technology, okay? It's just one piece of a bigger democratic puzzle. So we know that different groups have made their opinions known about technology uh, through protests, such as white collar workers who protested their company's work on certain military or immigration related projects. We've seen grassroots organizations protest around different forms of surveillance, particularly facial recognition technology. Um, we've seen tech workers organizing for better conditions in their workplaces, right? So this activity of public protest is iterative with a formal public participation mechanisms that can be going on in each realm can really learn from each other. We also know that people can and do build their own technologies that have inclusive and liberatory aspects to them. People can talk with their wallets, right? And not pay for engage with certain technologies that don't meet their needs. People can elect policymakers willing to put substantive controls and limits on dangerous forms of technology. So to my mind, there's no one form of participation that is gonna democratize AI. We need them all working together. What we're talking about today is very important, but it is by no means the only way that the public can and should shape the technology that is um, impacting our lives. Marini or Richard, can public participation truly shift power? I'll, I'll give you guys the last word. Um, I would just, I, I really love everything Michelle just said. And I, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for sort of uh, participation and pushback from the outside also. So 
it ideally this will be happening in companies or in research from the very start but there's i i think it's equally valuable to have sort of the the tools and critical ai literacy in the public for people to be able to ask questions about how did you do this like what was the data that you use be able to ha have systems to sort of question black box models um and the like the, the tools and language available to people to even ask those questions. So yeah, just pretty much just echoing what Michelle said. And I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to disrupt the consensus because I certainly agree with a lot of what M Michelle said as well. I think what I would say is that there are going to be parts of the world where it's going to be much harder to look at those alternative mechanisms for public participation. The ability to influence policymakers relies upon a functioning democracy. Um, which which does not exist, unfortunately, in, in, in the majority of the world. The ability to, you know, look to use other alternative technologies um, is met, is quite limited where you have monopolies or cartels or dominant dominant technology companies, which is which is often the case. And of course, if, if the technology is being used by, for example, the states, you, you can't opt out of, 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 of being affected by certain technologies. So I absolutely agree that there are a lot of different um means and mechanisms to try to influence technology beyond beyond public participation as we've discussed it today but that quite often that relies on other infrastructure or institutions being in place which which don't exist everywhere unfortunately now that's a really important point thank you for raising that I would like to uh turn it over then to audience q a and Alex Bird Bertchevskaya has a question for us. Um, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, this is for Harini. It, um, it's about this longer tale of your engagement that you talked about. And Alex is interested to hear more about this long-term uptake and integration of the tools that you built together into their work. And uh, have you worked with your partners longer term to give them... Um, you, you talked about that sustainability piece to make sure that they stay maintained and, and relevant. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a really good question. I think I the ways that we've tried to do this are sort of continuing to follow up with people who are using the system, sort of having regular um, events, regular evaluations, um, I I think to the point of involving partners in the maintenance itself so that it's not just dependent on us. I think that's a really great point. We've tried to do this in some ways, for instance, like one of the leader in the leadership of um, the project is, sorry, I phrased that wrong. One of the um, organizers of the whole initiative is an activist herself. Um, and so has like guided a lot of um, the, follow-ups that we've done. Um, but I think it's a great point in, in that like, there's a lot we could do in terms of more skill sharing to have activists actually involved in sort of the development work that we're doing so that it's not sort of a constant back and forth of, oh, this isn't working anymore. Can you fix it? Oh, we fix it. Okay, can you check? Can you evaluate it again? Um, th that's a great point. We haven't really done too much of that yet, but I think it's a great avenue for sort of making that maintenance work more sustainable. Um, I'm gonna ask the the second part of Alex's question, which I, I think is great. Um, are there participatory interventions that you've tried that didn't have the outcomes that you anticipated? They didn't work. Um, and, and if you have any reflections on why they didn't work, why they didn't quite succeed. Uh, Richard, might, might you have uh, some thoughts on the question? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of goes back to some of the points that that I've been I've been making earlier, which is around I think the challenges involved in in sort of really ongoing um, communication and engagement with stakeholders, rather than sort of at, at very specific at very specific points in time in a company's you know product lifecycle or or, or development. Um, I think what I would maybe like to point to is is that there are some examples of it working quite well though. So I think there have been instances whereby um, companies have been able to develop really good long-term trusted relationships with certain stakeholders, um, which once you reach a certain degree of trust, makes the company feel comfortable to bring them in to, 
to uh, a sort of an earlier stage of decision making and perhaps to see some more of what goes on behind the scenes of, of, of what the company's doing than would otherwise be the case. Um, and so there have been instances whereby companies have formed, for example, you know, advisory groups or, or human rights councils or some other kind of mechanism for that more ongoing deliberative engagement. And, you know, an example might be the Global Network Initiative, which is a collaboration of a number of large tech companies that, that meets and discusses quite regularly with a trusted group of civil society, academic investor and other stakeholders to talk through some of the challenges that the company is facing. And I think that allows for a more ongoing real-time discussion and therefore to sort of provide much more immediate quick feedback, um, um, you know, after initial period of engagement. So I think there are some good examples out there, but, but you know, they're relatively few and far between still. Karini, do you have any uh, stories of, of, of failure points in participation that you, you, you would be willing to share with our audience? Yeah, I mean, I think there there were some examples of things where we initially thought like, oh, this would be a good idea, or this is how we should design something. But then before we got to the point of building it, we realized through our collaboration that, oh, actually, this is not something we should include in the system. Um, so I guess those are like potential failures that didn't end up, that we didn't end up pursuing because we were able to catch them early enough. Um, I think as far as like something that we actually sort of ended up pursuing and deploying that didn't work as well as expected, I think I, I um, when I was talking about it, I mentioned that the first round of models that we built didn't work as well for certain groups, especially those that were monitoring more intersectional kinds of violence. And I think in part, that was because we worked more closely with two groups when we were developing the models, and those two groups didn't encompass sort of the context of all of the many groups who were then using the system or who, who then intended to use the system. So I think it was an, that arose because of an issue of, um, yeah, assuming that because we were doing this deep participation with, with like a smaller number of groups, it would then extend to all of them. And that wasn't the case, but luckily we had this sort of like pilot built in where we were able to evaluate it with many groups before we sort of onboarded like a ton of people. Um, yeah. All right, I'll just jump in with a question from Henry Samuelson. Are there any shortcuts for more expeditious ways of engaging community stakeholders for tech companies that like Richard talked about are under huge pressures to put their technology out quickly? And uh, what kinds of solutions uh, to this issue exist, especially in relation to generative AI. Richard, why don't you start? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, there's no shortcut, no. I think I think that the more you truncate your stakeholder engagement or your, your participation with external people, the, the, the less value it's going to be. Um, and the less meaningful it's going to be. That's not to say that that means that you should only ever try to strive for perfection because there will be times when that's not achievable. But I think you have to recognize that taking shortcuts you know, comes with a cost as well. I think what you what you want to do in those instances is, I think, try to, it ha as I mentioned before, like have the existing relationships with a good range of stakeholders so that you're not starting from scratch and having to build a new relationship, but, but hopefully you've got a pool that you can work with that, that are comfortable and confident to, to reach out to you. Um, but I think I want to kind of reflect on, on a point that I think Jessica made in one of her questions, I'm not sure if it's necessarily visible or not, which is that the challenge with doing stakeholder engagement in a rush because you're at very late and you've got these internal pressures is because you haven't engaged stakeholders from much earlier stage when you started to think about the kind of long-term technological development that you'd want to do as a company. And so it's all very well saying, well, we, we're ready to launch the product in six weeks. Let's talk to some people to see if there's any risk we can we can quickly tinker with at this point. But really, were you talking with stakeholder engagements when you decided as a company that Gentive AI was going to be your new line of business um, and that you, or maybe that you're going to start operating in a new part of the world? Um, so I think really, no, there's no shortcuts. There's ways to do it that are a bit, that are more, you know, not more efficient, but but that are quicker. You know, using existing relationships, prioritizing certain risks over others, and, and then focusing on the really high risk issues. Um, that's no substitute. But I think ultimately, what you need to do is greater stakeholder engagement at a far earlier stage, 
so that you're not having to rush it, you know, before before a product launch or, or when it's very difficult to to make much of a change internally. Uh, Michelle, I, I have a question. I think that'll be good good for you. I'm I'm gonna. Um... This is for this comes from Jessica Deer, who who raises a great question because I, I love the way she's pulling out some of the structural gaps here, which is that how can we expect the public to meaningfully participate in all of these issues, all of these technologies, when for so many of these companies, especially for AI, there is little to no transparency about what these systems do, how they operate. And she points to, in some cases, uh, perhaps legal frameworks, ways to legally compel. But I'm, I'm wondering, Michelle, what do you think about that, that tension? Yeah, I think it's a serious and important tension. I know that, or I strongly suspect that, you know, I've had clients who are struggling to find housing because of tenant screening reports or struggling to get employed because of employment algorithms. But you never, you don't always know for sure. You know, this transparency is serious. And then even if, you do find that out. We face the issue Jessica mentioned of, will anyone answer our questions, right? Because the companies will claim trade secrecy protection. And then even if you could get the source code, there are issues about its interpretability. I mean, I'm a lawyer. If you give me the source code, there's not that much I can do with it. I have questions I want answered, but the source code alone may not answer them. So one thing I'll say, if we have a robust public participation regime that requires the public to have a seat at the table when certain technologies are adopted and developed and deployed, that will have a transparency forcing aspect to it. So that's another benefit we actually haven't talked about yet of public participation, is it forces transparency. It's done that. Um, in environmental law, right, bringing light to shine on projects that could have significant environmental impacts. And I would expect it would have that transparency forcing um, aspect to it in this realm. Thank you so much, Michelle. I know that I speak for everybody present uh, when I say that the panelists bring so much insight and real world experience, so much deep engagement with the history and lessons learned from these topics. Uh, a few key things that I heard uh, include the consensus across panelists about the need to do this earlier and that one size does not fit all, that powerful institutions, whether it's government or tech companies, need to collaboratively design the engagement with their partners, be open to what they hear, and to invest in the partnerships to grow the number of uh, stakeholders that they're talking to, but also the capacity internally with each group. Uh, it is a long list of takeaways and learnings that I've had from this panel, including the need for hard law requirements from Michelle, that this not be left to the whims of public and private entities. And I'm so grateful for the worked example that we got through Harini's work of the extremely uh, important insights that are possible when we work with uh, experts from within communities who can point out what's missing, where do we need to collect more data. And I really loved her point about augmenting the work that uh, experts are already doing instead of replacing it. Richard reminds us of the constraints that are happening within tech companies but gave us such key lessons from the front lines and uh, our opportunities to do better, for example, by synchronizing the asks that we make of civil society from across different industry groups. So with that, I'd like to say that if you are as compelled by these questions as I am, you will be happy to hear that we are uh, starting an entire year of thinking together about these topics and, and maintaining that focus on the promise that participatory methods have for research, development, and governance, uh, because they can, and the evidence shows us that they can help to avert and address harm. Um, our kickoff is for a public participation exploration. We're looking at what it is, why to do it. We've already looked at those questions so well today, and we're going to continue to dig deeper. So some ways that you can stay connected, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can see the link for that in the chat. Uh, we are active on social media with the opportunities that are coming up. We just put together a uh, our own statement on what public participation means to us at Data and Society that you can catch in our points blog. And if you're doing work in this space, 
we want to connect with you. We want to spotlight you, learn from you because there's so much work left to do. So uh, please send us your projects at participation at data and society, data society .net. Finally, I just want to, again, profoundly thank these amazing panelists, Harini Suresh and Richard Wingfield and uh, my co-host, Policy Director Brian Chen, and of course, Michelle Gilman, whose policy brief, Democratizing AI, Principles for Public, Meaningful Public Participation, is the reason that we gathered today. You can find a link to that in the chat, and all the reference material from today's talk will be posted on our website, datasociety.net. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.